everybody, welcome to back. Here's some Sal. I'm Ben. And I'm Tiffany. Oh, it's time for another Redux, baby! Since you haven't been on the last Redux episode, you're welcome to hit the Redux button. Yeah, all right! So Spider-Man Torment from Todd McFarlane and Marvel Comics Spider-Man came out in 1990. It was the adjectiveless Spider-Man book that was launched essentially to keep Todd McFarlane from leaving and forming Image. Yeah. Come on, you can draw these detailed webs! Yeah, now he had been doing that already. Todd McFarlane was poached from DC. It wasn't really poached. It was more like Mark Gruenwald came to Jim Salakrup and he's like, you gotta look at this dude's pencils. And of course, back then, Marvel kind of like had a house style. So while Salakrup was impressed by Todd's prowess, he did try to rein Todd in when they inevitably brought Todd over to Marvel. Uh, to kind of keep it within the standards of what was expected, you know? Mm. I mean, John Romita Jr. had to draw like John Romita Sr. Todd McFarlane had to draw like John Romita Jr. It was just very like, make sure it stays... Like Todd McFarlane Sr. Right. <laughs> and so as a result, uh, Todd, well, immediately stifled and immediately fought back against it and helped pioneer what they would refer to as the spaghetti webbing, which was originally Spider-Man's webbings was just lines. Yeah. Two, two lines and some lines in between it. That was essentially how it was, because it was hard to draw or it was complicated or we didn't want to get into it. And Well, it didn't need to be complicated. We knew what it, they were trying we to get portray. it, exactly, very implied. And Todd was like, no, let's get real hyper detailed on it and make it make no sense. And reportedly, one of the editors was just constantly complaining about, get that damn spaghetti webbing out of there. And Todd's like, ho ho, you don't like my spaghetti webbing. Well, how about even more? It's like he would just work all the webbing in there. And that was back when he was working on Amazing Spider-Man with people like David Michelinie and creating characters like Venom. So that had already happened. Like Venom's already here. Todd McFarlane is already a household name. His style is already one of the top and he is getting restless. Because and people love it. People love it. Now, folk at the top don't, or at the very least they are, they I, don't get it. I they, imagine they don't love it because it takes longer to come out. I don't know, it's funny. It only started taking longer to come out when they formed their own company. Mm. Like the image books were delayed heavily. And I think that's just because it's like, well, let me put a whole bunch of artists in charge of writing, publishing, printing, and corralling talent and have them also make their own books. And it's like, yeah, it's, there's gonna be delays. Mm -hmm. Also, they have never run a company before, nor have they published their own books. I digress. Todd McFarlane's already a household name, and he has already essentially got it in his head that he's the reason Spider-Man is selling. Like, Spider-Man, the flagship character of Marvel, is selling because Todd McFarlane is on the book. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Oh. It isn't how it will always be, but certainly at this point, the tail is wagging the dog, as far as Marvel's concerned. Right. And Todd is feeling it and knows it and is also, as we know in the here and the future, business savvy. And so for him, he's like, I am never going to progress. I'm never going to grow unless I get out of this. I also need to establish myself as like, a, not just like a, a brand, but also like a threat. Like I can write, I can draw, I can do this on my own. I don't need you. I can make my own action figures. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> It's funny because, yes, and I think he loves it more. Like, I know he loves drawing, and I know that he is known for it, but I think he seems to get more excited about the toys nowadays. Yeah, but it's really hard to set up, like, a little PlayStation in your room mm -hmm. with just pictures. Exactly. They stand well. You know, incidentally... They can't we, fight. We did talk about this in the Spawn Redux episode, but when Todd sold the action figure line to merchants like... Toys R Us, he didn't have prototypes, so he just drew what the figures were going to look like, and those were on the table when they were presenting. So actually, <laughs> Todd McFarlane is intimately familiar with creating a PlayStation of toys that are just drawings. He's like, here, this is what it'll look like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, and uh, the head of, uh, oh, that one's got a crease. Uh, the, the, the head of the company's kid saw it and was like, that's Todd McFarlane, sign him. And that's how it all worked out. But anyway, right now, Todd is getting restless and he wants to leave Amazing Spider-Man and Jim Salakrup and company are like, let's not let him do that. How about this? And it's, Salakrup will say that it coincided with a desire to do other things besides desperately keep Todd McFarlane at Marvel. Mm -mm. Salakrup has this idea that he wants to get more self-contained Spider-Man trade paperbacks on the shelves. Trade paperbacks are becoming more in vogue. DC's eating their lunch in the trade paperback and original series department, or at least in the self-contained stories department. If you wanted to read like a seminal Spider-Man story, 
for the most part, the trade you got was Craven's Last Hunt. That's more or less it. And it was also heavily inspired by, in, not in terms of story, JMD Mateus will be very quick to tell you that that story is not inspired by like Dark Knight Returns or anything outside of his own purview. But the desire to make that concept from a publishing standpoint was easily made because DC was making Legends of the Dark Knight Batman stories. And they're like, here are five part, four part stories that you can easily make into trades and then sell to bookstores and comic book stores and people who are interested in Batman without having to get into like 800 issues of continuity. Oh look, I can sell my book twice. That's right, that's right, two bites of the same apple. So Marvel's like, how do we do that with Spider-Man? Though it will be in continuity and it'll just be a compliment title like Web of Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man called, and the fans will refer to this as adjectiveless Spider-Man. Because something has to go in front of Spider-Man. <laughs> well, otherwise, if you say, I'm reading Spider-Man, for the longest time, let's say 50 years, people are like, oh, you mean Amazing Spider-Man. And I'm sure there's a couple of smart alecky people who are like, no, I mean spectacular Spider-Man. <laughs> I mean friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. That book wouldn't come until the early 2000s. Just way too late. And also was really antithetical to its title. And it was the beginning of Babylon 5 creator J. Michael Straczynski's run uh, for Spider-Man The Other which would begin with Spider-Man being beaten to death by Morlun. So obviously very friendly and, and fun. Just a really whimsical book. Mike Waringo's style was so suited to like joy and fun and exuberance. And it's like, well, how about doing the other, the super dour, miserable magic event? And it's like, oh, well, sorry, Mike. So Spider-Man Torment. We want to make a kind of like five part mini series that could be a trade like this one, the first trade of Torment ever. And so they did. And so it was like, oh, then Todd can write and draw. Here you go. What, what if we gave you a whole book all for yourself? And Yeah, inflate the ego a little bit. Well, I mean, it doesn't hurt. Jim Salker was also quick to remind readers, Todd McFarlane didn't get to just do whatever he wanted. <laughs> okay? And it's like, I mean, didn't he though? But Salker will point to things that were or were not Todd's decision. You know, like... In this story, which we're using the loosest term for story, by the way, because this is essentially Todd McFarlane's first written book, is Spider-Man Torment. Okay. Now, he's worked on Amazing Spider-Man for years at this point and has made a lot of success as a result, but he's never really gotten to craft plot and he never really got to determine what he wanted to draw. Like, he got to draw what other people wanted him to draw and that was also really stifling for him. Which is Spider-Man punching people. Oh, yeah. Or, or Aunt May dealing with old people being boarders at her old house in Forest Hills. And it's like, you can imagine that like young, hot, spawn creator Todd McFarlane is really not excited by drawing a lot of old geriatric people hanging around in a dining room. That's a mistake, Todd. Think about all the detail you could put into those tea doilies. Aunt Spaghetti May. doilies? <laughs> I will say, you know, this is the era of artists putting lines on everything, and I've never seen an open canvas more available for lines than an old person's face. And Aunt May is the oldest she's ever looked. <laughs> That's not true. I've seen much older looking Aunt May's five part torment story. It's a is story. This, is this the same thing as same that? Same thing as this. So here, you can look through it if you want to. I don't think any other artist or writer has been given a greater opportunity than, than Tom McFarlane given Spider Man. A new Spider Man title in years. The premier artist is writing his own story, and it's the number one solo character at Marvel. Like, that's an amazing platform. So for him, he's like, it's probably gonna be my worst story. <laughs> Which he fully admits. He's like, it's probably gonna be crappy, especially compared to what I will write later, because I'll only get better as I exercise that muscle. And he's not technically wrong, though nostalgia goggles are very thick and very affixed to my face when it comes to Spider-Man Torment. So for me, I'm like, it, uh, is it worse than anything else you've written? I would say no. What year was this? 1990. Spider-Man has a villain called the Lizard. The Lizard's alter ego is Dr. Kurt Connors, who is a married scientist who lost his arm in the war. And uh, depending on what decade you're in, that war will shift, whether it was Vietnam, the Gulf War, or in other media, just like an accident or something, whatever. So the tragedy of the lizard is, of course, like, he's a Jekyll and Hyde situation. Oh, I'm a guy, I don't want to be a monster, I've turned myself into a monster, what'll I do? You know, Instead of just accepting... That he's a lizard? No, except... No, that he has a missing arm. Yeah, instead of just accepting that Oh, it's no, like... it, it, he doesn't keep going like, Nyah! like he, he 
he did it the one time. Right, but and if it, he had just accepted. Oh, yes. Yeah, but he was also that's using his it as folly. a. folly. It's man's folly. That's true. That's true. So uh, he, he was trying to push his science to extremes, wasn't yeah. he? No, he was actually, he was using himself as a guinea pig for his research. But I think his research is also heavily inspired by his desire to have two arms again. Uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, in the previous how, story. How great would it be if he's like, you know, I'm trying to develop technology so that people who lose limbs can regrow them back. That's what he's saying. Oh, like yourself. What? No. Oh, no, 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 I'm fine. No, I'm fine. Why would you say that? Invariably, his wife, this poor woman who's been through like at least seven or eight lizard stories is like, we have a son, man. <laughs> so uh, in 1989, the X-Men are having a massive event called Inferno. And there's- well, That's going well for them. Oh yeah, so there's demons running amok and yeah. a demon stresses got Connors out hard enough to become the lizard. And uh, he freaks out and ultimately they fix him, but only because of magic and demons, not the cure that they normally have for him. And so he essentially says goodbye to his wife and kid and goes like, I can never be with you because I'm a mess. Because and like I can't drive in traffic without it being a danger. That's right. And he's not wrong because one day he will eat his son. Wait, really? Yeah, yeah. No, it's horrible, I hate it. Uh, he's not wrong to leave them. So that's where Lizard is. Lizard's off the table, but also, you know, just only a matter of time. Lurking in the shadows. Yes, yes. Uh, so that's where Lizard is. And Spider Man is happily married to his wife, Mary Jane, in their apartment in Soho. That's it. Like, that's what you need to know about Spider Man. Oh, good. That'll never change. No, I can't imagine a story where that would change, nor a future in which that Especially is not for the status like, quo. You know, seemingly petty reasons. Absolutely. So. A few things they're trying to do. They want to do a five-part story that'll be at a trade. They also want to have an excuse to up the paper quality. Uh, Torment sells 2.6 million copies. Wow. What? The first one? First issue of Spider-Man sells 2.5 million lot Is that copies. a lot at the speculator market? Uh, you tell me because Rob Liefeld's X-Force after this will sell 3.6 million copies. So it's definitely the speculator market. And then after that, Jim Lee's X-Men will sell seven. 0.8 million copies. Now, as far as retailers and publishers and fans are concerned, that just means that this gravy train's never gonna stop. I mean, I would not think that. And anyone who maybe is in real estate might go, uh, that looks like a bubble to me. No one knew, you know, the trend was just up. And with Spider-Man number one, it was just, Todd is a hot commodity, Spider-Man's a big character, 2.5 million copies in 1990, that's just, that's just great news. So for them, it's just like, that's awesome, and it is. And it's just completely dictating their line from now on, by the way. You know, especially when Liefeld's X-Force and Lee's X-Men are concerned. It's just like, oh, this is where we're going. I don't understand why we're not hitting seven million all the time now. <laughs> yeah, then that's a problem that uh, they'll never get over. And when I say they, I mean the world, you know, with short-term gains and ridiculous expectations, unrealistic expectations. Well, we hit it once. Why can't we do it again? Why can't we do it every quarter? We can also talk about Torment through the lens of our trade, our singles, or our oversized Todd McFarlane art book that Tiffany got me for Christmas one year. I'm really oh glad God. I was able to lift that one hand. I was yeah. like, oh, I don't know if I could do this. This has uh, a number of Spider-Man Todd McFarlane pages, including some of the pages from Torment. So you can really dig into it. I'm like, wow, let's talk about that. I wish that. we had more back issues like this. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Obviously, again, Todd is learning how to write, basically. And so he, he, he commits a few cardinal sins. Like he switches perspectives on narrator multiple times. It's not an error. It's just a decision that he's made because he thinks it's cool. Right. Sorry, of course, is this the right scale? Is this how big they're drawing it and they just shrink it down for the comic? Yeah. That makes a lot more sense Well, in they my usually head now. do, what is it like? I don't, know if, I don't know if it's 11 by 14 or 11 by 17. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, regarding the coloring, um, Todd will color his own work in issue four. But I really love the coloring in Torment. I think that the coloring is better in Torment than it is on Todd's work in the original Amazing Spider-Man series. Um, especially in the reprints. The reprints are just, ugh. I didn't know it was going to be this big when I ordered it. <laughs> I knew it was going to be big. I but did. I didn't know it was gonna be the size of a person's torso. I didn't realize it was gonna make me look like I was sitting on an oversized chair yeah. Yeah, yeah. reading a giant's book. <laughs> so Spider-Man Torment is of course written and drawn by Todd McFarlane with colors by Bob Sharon and Gregory Wright and Todd McFarlane. And Todd McFarlane. Does Todd and do his own lettering? 
No, the lettering is... Uh, you don't have to tell me. I just wanted to know if he was like also like, and I'll do my own lettering. You know, it's interesting because Rick Parker is credited as lettering, but I noticed that there's a thing that Todd does, and I'm sure we talked about this before, but in all of his Spider-Man, Spider-Man, not Peter Parker, but when Spider-Man is talking, he has different speech balloons than everybody else, which of course he'll carry over into Spawn. But with Spawn, he'll do a whole special... Thing, yeah, graphic green outline. Thing. But you'll notice, like, with his speech balloons, he gets a little extra balloon outside of the big balloon. It's just a weird thing that I, you know, if you read a book a hundred times in a row, you're going to notice these things. Is that what? every time he talks? Only when Spider Man talks. No, I meant, but is that every time Every he time Spider Man talks. Okay. Because yeah. I was going to say that that looks like a whisper to me. Yeah. It's not, because the whispers are these, and it's all lowercase letters. Or whimpers. Maybe they're his, um, they're spaghetti balloons. <laughs> it could just be that he's like, I want you to do something similar to the spaghetti webbing to annoy the hell out of the editors. But uh, yeah, it's just a, it, it's a fun idea. I don't get it. I think for me, the well, decision you know, is just to, di to differentiate the hero. Yeah, you automatically know it's him. Yeah. yeah. But it kind of has a webbing effect to it. Yeah. Maybe it's because he's talking through a mask. I think that's, that, that's how I always justified it is. It's the effect the mask has on Spider-Man's voice. It's slightly muffled. Right? So, <laughs> again, like the story is basically Spider-Man is targeted by an unseen foe who uses the lizard as their extension of malice until Spider-Man is tormented into a fight that ultimately ends without any real resolution. That's the story. The reason to read this is to look at Todd McFarlane's art and to marvel at it, lowercase m, no pun intended. <laughs> I understand, through the lens of like looking at modern comics today, nothing looks like this. And maybe it shouldn't, because it's very much a product of its time. But every time I open a page of Torment, I'm like, awesome. The double page splash that introduces Spider-Man, or reintroduces Spider-Man to the audience, is just, to put it mildly spectacular. So we well, there's life to it. Like, yeah. oh, I'm swinging and I'm pulling and suddenly yeah, it's it conveys slack. motion. Does Todd do his own inks on this? Yes. Oh, good. He didn't make another human being have to go over this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and it's interesting you should ask that because I believe Jim Salakrup asked Todd to try inking his own work. He's like, I can't ask another human being to do that. No, because he has had inkers do his own work before and it doesn't look as good. Mm. What's funny about that is that Todd will inevitably start inking other people's work as he progresses into Spawn and stuff. After, and after adding little lines to it. Well, of course, well that's, you know, adds embellishment and adds depths and shading. Wait. Todd will get a, an itch for inking after okay. this. Um, and I think that Todd's work looks better when it's inked by him anyway. Oh sure, I mean he has a better understanding of it and since his, his style at the time was mm -hmm. so drastically different, yeah. there wouldn't probably be an inker out there who knew how to approach this. Sure, the art is not without its flaws but even then, the have, decisions are so, like, strong. Like, there's such a deliberate approach to his art that I'm like... I, I agree, and we can talk about that in issue two in particular, because there's a couple of things I noted, and we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm like, that, I'm like, that's not good. Well, like, it's, like, not good. His Spider-Man is always awesome, but right. there is one panel where it's just... It, there's too much going on, and that's one of the criticisms of it when it first came out, was, like, the art is busy, and the writing is pretentious and I'm like wow that criticism will follow Todd up until Spawn Batman 3 <laughs> and I, you know this is all one continuous strand of web <laughs> yeah. I just followed it just, yeah Isn't that it's cool? insane <laughs> Yeah. I, yeah. Ben, ben is in on the madness of torment. There's also an interesting like narrative device that carries throughout every beginning of every issue, which is the decision to say, rise above it all. Oblivious to the crowds, the congestion, the pressure, and yet at some times, some wish that they could rise above it all. It's juxtaposing the mundanity of human beings walking around in the streets of New York while Spider-Man swings above it, and we get to go along with him. Yay. Cool, that's the experience. But Todd's like, but I'm writing. So Rise Above It All has to be the next page turn in every issue of this story. And so sometimes it works better than others. You know, like issue two. The opening of like issue two, for example, is a couple of like stockbrokers or whatever, just a couple of old gross men. And one of them is talking about like reading a personal ad for a woman soliciting a sugar daddy. And 
her personal ad says, please write because together I think we can take a fantasy trip and try to rise above it all. And I'm like, all right. Like, it's... So you can it, see how, like... It's kind of lost. That, that You just lost your, your punch immediately. Yeah, but we already sold 2.5 million copies, so whatever. Who They're cares? immovable. These buildings that seem to... <gasps> Rise, Rise above, above it, it all. all. <laughs> it's like, okay. Really? Is it everyone? Every single issue begins with Rise Above It All. Against Spider-Man, no matter what, he will always rise above it all. <laughs> Come on. Seriously? When you need the dough enough, finally the elasticity is there, and then it will rise, rise above, above it, it all. all. The smoke's sole purpose is to drift aimlessly and to... Rise above it all! <laughs> I don't remember us talking about this at all in the last episode, but we probably did. Do you remember every conversation we've had about comic books that was 10 years ago? <laughs> uh, yes! I value every conversation you and I have had. Wow, that's really sweet. But I definitely don't. From a liar! <laughs> <laughs> How about you and I rise, rise above, above it all. all? See, I turned the page. You did, you did. You turned the page. And you made it work. Is this Todd's Spider-Man? Yes, it is. Is this the first time it's been used? No, it's not. Oh, okay. No, and as you might notice, that Spider-Man is a little more like yeah, that's why style than his. It threw me off because the web seemed more in line with Todd, and mm -hmm. it's it's like more interestingly positioned than Spider-Man has been. Yes, uh, that's actually it's funny you should mention that because there's a story behind it. Uh, Todd McFarlane. When he started drawing Spider-Man, he was like the Spider-Man in the top left corner of every cover. They would occasionally rotate the Spider-Man that like reflected the Spider-Man of the book. Okay. But it was very rare. And the one that Todd inherited was not his. And he was like, hey, I'd like to take a crack at redoing it or submitting one for like my run. And so Todd drew the upside down Spider-Man and it's much more in line with what Marvel expected Spider-Man to look like in those books before Todd became Todd McFarlane. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they used that one. And yeah, what's funny about it is that, you know, he drew it for Marvel, Marvel used it in their books, and then that was the end of it. But one day, years ago, Todd McFarlane gets a package in the mail, and it's from Marvel, and it's the original pencils for that image. Wow, they someone, kept it? Someone found it. It was just in a drawer or in a filing cabinet somewhere. And someone at Marvel was like, oh, it's Todd's original art for this iconic image of Spider-Man. Please Let me sign send it, and send it back, back to him. <laughs> like, why why wouldn't it... they archive it? Well, Todd can do whatever the hell he wants with no, it. No, why I... wouldn't they archive it? Don't they own it? Yes, they do. That's what's so baffling to me is like, they just mailed it back to him. Now, maybe they did archive it, and then they were like, well, we have a digital. So here you go, Todd, you can have the original. Right, but that's like a museum piece. It absolutely is. And that is also what baffles me. And I don't know what the contracts look like for the artists who work for these larger companies. Back then, they looked pretty bad. Right, but like, I'm just always surprised at the lack of like, seeming archives Yes. from DC and Marvel. Oh yeah, no. Uh, Tiffany and I particularly, whenever we go to Comic Cons, there is invariably like a giant showcase of original art from decades of comic books and just the absolute lack of reverence that is treated for original art is just staggering to me. Yeah. It, just, it, just pages of iconic pieces of art or just pieces of art in general that are slapped into a, like a binder and just dumped into like, a pe into a like, plastic they're, bin. They're portfolios. Yes. But the fact that like everyone can anyone just look can just at grab it and pick it up and it, leaf it, through it. It drives me nuts. And like I do love looking at art, and I love when artists bring stuff like that. But I usually yeah, at their table. If they're at their table and they are watching me and they know like if something is being mishandled. Right. If you're eating an ice cream cone, you're like, hey, can I look through your portfolio? They're gonna go, no. Yeah. <laughs> or come like, back after just, you've washed your hands. It, it bothers me. Yeah, it, it really does, and uh, it also shows that none of these artists have access to their own work. You know, like those pages. But some of them do. Like a lot of them sell them online now. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or they work with a with an auction house to yeah, sell their art. Yeah. 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 But yeah. anyway, it's sorry. a dicey situation. But uh, the weird thing is, I remember seeing a little video that Todd made of like him receiving the the piece and then being like, "Oh, it's cool," but like, where is it now? With a note that just said, "Clean up your shit next time." <laughs> <laughs> we also have a half-eaten bagel from 1992. <laughs> No, no, not, not your mother. <laughs> We're Marvel, damn it. So Spider-Man saves this woman from being brutalized by this assailant. Um, the reason to look at it is because of this awesome image of Spider-Man suspended by his own webs and, and shrouded in darkness. It's the image I think of when I think of Spider-Man. 
That's the image you think of when you think of Spider-Man. Not him like swinging across the city it's or this. you know pointing porch. at himself. It's this. Yeah. <laughs> nope. It's just this. Wow. So it's awesome and it's dark and it's cool. If you've ever just seen Sal like when he's on a sh like someone else's podcast or whatever, yep. and he's just like, he's I'm just thinking of I'm thinking of the first four pages of <laughs> Torment. <laughs> So Spider-Man humiliates the thug, you know, like the thug tries to get him and he breaks the gun with his incredible strength and the narration... Excuse me, his proportional spider strength. That's correct. Uh, his... The, he focuses the totality of his spider strength into... <laughs> into the fingertips of his hands and then crushes a fucking barrel of a gun. The the, the narration, of course, is... Actually, it's funny because Todd has like a lot of criticisms of Stan Lee and yet... There's a lot of similarities where he's just describing what's going on on the page. Right. Uh, you know, he says, a spider sense delivers the warning. Like, I, I see that. I know. Uh, enhanced reflexes take care of the rest. Obviously, they do. So, you know, Spider-Man, like, we get a win. You know, we're introducing Spider-Man to, we're introducing readers to Spider-Man again. Yeah, because obviously Todd is banking on the fact that people are picking this up who don't know who the hell Spider-Man is. But they do know who Todd McFarlane is. Right, I mean, I guess that's what he's thinking. He's like, there's a chance. There's a chance you don't know. That's why there's actually a moment where we need to work in Spider-Man's origin, mm -hmm. which is a thing that they would do a lot. You know, anytime Spider-Man's fighting Venom, we gotta have a moment where, you know, Venom's of course like, we were innocent once until that accursed Spider-Man ruined our lives. Here's my friggin' backstory. Spider-Man often, like, there's an opportunity, especially in a first issue. Usually in an annual or first issue, oh, by the way, remind the audience how Spider-Man got his powers. Right. And his whole power responsibility thing. And that could be where you see the similarities between him and, and Stan, because it's like, Stan is a business guy. Yeah. And McFarlane is also becoming oh, a business guy. Big and time. so he's like, yeah, no, people are gonna buy this because of me, because he also very, does think highly of himself. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, so I, have to, I am going to be the shepherd of Spider-Man to them. Right. I also could imagine another reality where there is no origin of Spider-Man put in the book because that takes up real estate for another awesome thing to happen. And Salakrup being like, you gotta work in the origin, it's a first. Like it's, it's, an, it's a template for an original graphic novel that's gonna be on shelves. People who have never read Spider-Man are gonna be introduced to Spider-Man for the first time. I need his origin in there. Like make sure it gets in there. Mm -hmm. but, and it shows up in a time when who cares? We need to pad the time anyway. So. Spider-Man stops this thug very easily, very handily. This is what Spider-Man does, and this is how uh, successful he is at it. Uh, when Spider-Man's dealing with a regular guy, you know, he rises above it all. Good for you. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, there are some drums being played in the darkness of New York. Wait, I don't really? know. Yep, just okay. some drums. Yeah, it's called a club. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we do go to a couple of nightclubs in this story. <laughs> this unseen figure. I'm not gonna bury the lead, it's Calypso. Calypso is actually a character who was, I believe was invented by Denny O'Neill, who of course pioneered the like five to six issue miniseries. But anyway, uh, he invents Calypso as a love interest for Craven the Hunter back in the day. I always remember this character and I remember some things that happen and I don't know where it happened in. This is it. Okay. So uh, Craven and Calypso used to bang and uh, she did also hit the drum as well as Craven. In one of the appearances of Calypso with Craven, she does play this drum. She there's a previous story where like she drugs Spider-Man. She's like really mad that Craven won't kill Spider-Man because like Spider-Man is thin and weak and Craven is strong and big and he shouldn't be able to lose to Spider-Man. So does she know anything about the proportional strength of a spider? She barely cares. But she does poison him with like a blow dart and he is then weakened, and so so Craven ultimately beats him because Craven has no effing powers, and uh, and then Craven notices, and he's like, "Wait a minute, Cliff, so damn it!" And he gives himself up to the authorities. He's like, "No, it's not honorable. You know nothing of honor." And then just like goes to jail. Is and then, that where they got the idea for that Harley Joker story? What? You know where like Harley's like mad love? Yeah. It certainly echoes it, where it's like we got the main villain and their female villainous sidekick, who then <laughs> steals his thunder, and then the villain in turn abuses her <laughs> and then gives up the hero. Yeah, it is similar to Mad Love, I okay. suppose. Well, there you go. If you like Mad Love, read that other story. <laughs> the, yeah, no, read Mad Love, <laughs> you're good. So, but as we all know, the fate of Craven the Hunter is uh, he Craven last hunters himself and Calypso uh, fades into obscurity because who's gonna use Calypso outside of the context of Craven? Uh, so Todd's like, oh, Calypso, got it. <laughs> so he uses Calypso. And so Calypso's like mad that Craven is dead and it's Spider-Man's fault. And I was surprised because as a kid, I didn't know who Calypso was. And I was just introduced to her as this. 
And this book makes no attempt to contextualize or explain who Calypso Todd's was. Todd's like, you don't need to know. She's a warrior woman, and I have a thing for them. That's true. <laughs> uh, and Spider-Man doesn't recognize her or know who she is, which is not true. He does. He should. He's met her before. But again, as a young reader, you're like, new character. I'm in. And it's like, nope, she's not. But who cares? So Calypso's mad, and it took her a couple years to finally decide to get her revenge on Spider-Man by using her magic to resurrect or to unleash the lizard and use her magic to control the lizard and unleash the lizard. So there is also like a Todd McFarlane drawn, but David Michelinie written lizard story, and that's the story that gets rid of the lizard and then brings it back here. I assume what he's doing right now is because the drum is, is, is tied into some sort of primal magic and since the lizard seems to have this like primal nature to him, it's yeah. like, it's just, he's compelled. Yeah, and it, and it works seamlessly because the lizard is awesome looking. But it's funny because one of the things that Jim Salaker wants to remind the reader is that like Todd didn't get to do everything he wanted to do and Todd apparently didn't want to use the lizard, but all the characters that Todd wanted to use before the lizard were already being utilized in other stories, but the lizard was off the table, so Todd got to use the lizard. My assumption is, if that's true, Todd didn't want to reuse the lizard because he already drew the lizard. <laughs> Todd got to use the lizard. Right, yeah, yeah. But I also assume that like Todd probably rejected the lizard first, because like, I drew the lizard, lizard's old news. Right. But it also, I, I can't think of a better villain for this story outside of like vermin. And that's not as iconic. Like it, Vermin is a rat man. And also Vermin was the other villain of Craven's Last Hunt. And we're already kind of aping off Craven's Last Hunt, so like, let's not go all the way with it. Unless Todd wanted to use Vermin, in which case, oh, it's like a spiritual sequel to Craven's Last Hunt, which of course we already have in Soul of the Hunter, which we've already covered. Anyway, Lizard's the bad guy. Okay. Being used as a puppet by Calypso. So then we go home with Spider-Man and Mary Jane and Mary Jane's hair because uh, normally when you first meet Mary Jane by John Romita Sr., uh, she has straight red hair. Uh, once uh, she well, gets- Well, it's easy in, to draw. Yeah, but once she gets into the 80s, her hair will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, now we're in the 90s. Much and, like the 80s. Yeah, that's right. So her hair gets nice and big and red. So it's perfect to have you on the show. Uh, to represent Mary Jane in this. But yeah, uh, Mary Jane and Pete are just hanging out. And Pete uh, ha is having a really like weird, banal conversation with Mary Jane. I, I, I have to give it a little bit of top marks for this. Todd marks? Oh. The conversations they have are not tied to anything that has happened in other stories. You know, one of the trademarks of a David Michelinie Spider-Man book is that it constantly refers to itself or to mm, a previous mm. story, or to other continuity. Well, it can't refer to itself. It can't, it's it's supposed to be, by design, like its own thing. It's in continuity, but it is supposed to be like someone's first Spider-Man story. And I, I wonder how many people's this, which might give you a weird, kind of skewed vision of what Spider-Man is like, but uh, <laughs> you know, the conversation they have is essentially Spider-Man being like, why did that punk think he could beat me? I'm Spider-Man and I'm great. Like, I have fought a bunch of different characters. And he names a bunch of characters, but there's no asterisk, which as a kid baffled me, because I was like, where's the annotation that tells me about those fights? Like he says, I even had a fight against Thanos for God's sake. And I'm like, when? And it's like, actually there's a couple of them. So this is one of the pages. I think that he does not draw normal faces that are not old or meant to be more ugly. Right. Well. 20 somethings look weird. At all. Like this is, his faces are a little amateur hour for me. Mm -hmm. When you compare it to the rest of this book, I think it is just like, it is, it's not good. Yeah, like and, the anatomy's off? And it's all off. I mean, look at Peter's eyes in that top panel. Yeah, like, I, huge. I know what he's doing, because he's like, oh, well, that eye's further away. And I'm like, and it ain't that much further away. Right. <laughs> it ain't that far away. Like, it's just, there's so many things that are in, like incorrect about it. Mm -hmm. Proportions and just, it just, it drives me nuts. Yeah. Because of how, well done other things are and yes. how stylized they are. And this is so not stylized. In fact, it's like, it's like he just wants to get away from this. That's exactly what it is. He's but like, like I don't want to be here. Like that opening with like the woman and, and the guy, like no one there is meant to be like uber attractive or anything like that, right? Like right, it's so just, it plays to his strengths. Like, it's he's an like, older woman. It's, it's like a guy who's meant to be villainous. So it definitely plays to his strengths. This is not his strength. No. Is just regular people. So Lizard just tears people up. Like the idea is we're just juxtaposing Pete and Mary Jane talking about their lives, or actually it's more like just Spider-Man being like, 
dude, I'm dope, aren't I? And she's like, I guess. Like, I feel like you're kind of, like, really overdoing it. And he's like, nah. Nah, I'm great. Yeah. And I guess that's, you know, where pride cometh before the fall. You know, like, he's going to get... He's gonna get put through the ringer, and we're gonna see some like more iconic imagery of Spider-Man, like just getting the crap kicked out of him, which is kind of fun. That's like seeming. That's like everything. Yeah, I know. It's like like, like when does that not happen? Right. Well, for, it's weird because yes, it happens a lot, but I guess like maybe it happens too much, and it's because of this. But Spider-Man got the crap kicked out of him like from the Juggernaut when he was trying to protect Madame Web. You know, like we've seen him get his keister handed to him multiple times throughout his entire career. Yet, with this, when he gets his butt kicked, it seems like it's just really, really brutal. And... Savage, almost? It is super savage. And I feel like it's because, like, every time after that, it seems like it's just trying to reach this level. Mm. I don't know. But anyway, so, one of the dudes who hasn't been killed by Lizard yet pulls out a gun and blows the Lizard away. You know, and we're seeing a lot more blood in a Spider-Man comic than we ever have before. But it's for Lizard, so I guess it's okay. Yeah. But, uh... Give me the book. You see the bullets just flying That's through true. him. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't that get book. that. It's censored. He replaces a panel of the lizard getting blown away with a hand. Oh, yeah, like, wow. That's a bit much. I kind of love it. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Damn. Wow. Meanwhile, at uh, Calypso's lair, which is apparently just like a cathedral slash estate in like Manhattan, uh, she maybe she's in Craven's old place. Yeah, it's yeah, maybe. It's weird. Craven has like an estate way upstate, but also he could have had like you know a really nice apartment. He was rich, so she pricks her finger and pours blood into a chalice, and then suddenly the lizard is back. Like lizard is being sustained slash preserved slash resurrected slash manipulated by blood magic. Oh, so these guys escape. Spider-Man wakes up the next morning. The news has covered these slaughterings and taken a picture of a wall near the bodies and there's something scrawled in the wall with blood, which is, I guess, Kurt Connors trying to come out of the lizard and put his own name on the wall. It's a stretch. What? It's a real stretch, but it's what Spider-Man needs to see in order to put the dots together and make the lizard has returned out of it. Um, that, by the way, Pete does not see that initially. Like he just puts his costume on, swings around, talks about how great being Spider-Man is and how he's so lucky he doesn't wear a cape because then he wouldn't be able to do all this amazing acrobatics because it'd get in the way. How does Thor manage, ha ha ha. And also maybe- He doesn't do acrobatics. Well, no, he just, he just goes in a straight line. The, the, the hammer carries him. But, Clearly uh, he's not fighting for liberty. No, because obviously you would need to wear a cape in order to do so. I'm Boys, sorry. sorry. Please. Yeah, the yeah. cape? Go, yeah, okay. the cape is complicated. It's complicated. Uh, I cite Spawn? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's like he figures it out. And he manages to get both things. He gets the cape, he gets the spaghetti webbing, replacing it with chains. Yeah, I was going to say, you're doing the spaghetti webbing. That's detailed and intricate enough. You're complaining about a cape? Yeah, yeah well, and I, I, I cite the cape, though, because Spawn is just a big living cape. Yeah, with a Spider-Man costume inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but there are holes in that cape. It's different. No, only later. Only when his costume decides to change and look more hardcore. Has Tom McFarlane ever drawn, like, a Wonder Woman book? No. He, he has drawn Wonder Woman before. Has he ever written a Wonder Woman book? Hell no. I just feel like... Yeah. It would have been like a prime him trying out some Angela stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Not well, that he, he came up with Angela. He didn't invent so, sorry, Angela. some Tiffany stuff. Yeah, I guess so. <gasps> so a couple of Wall Street guys get eaten or killed by the lizard. Really interesting dynamic double page splash. Oh, those are the guys who were gonna be like rising above. Yes, they're all. rising above it all. Yep. I really like this. I'm guessing Todd designed this. Definitely. Yeah. The. I like Title the spider. Page. I like. I actually like the the lettering down here. Yeah. I know it's like it ridiculous. evokes that kind of feeling of like creepiness. Yeah, but like this is genius. Yeah, like this is yeah. really good. I don't like the fact that the T isn't symmetrical, but <laughs> and they used it twice. Right. And neither is the M. Okay, stop looking at it. Moving yeah, on. Moving it's, on. It's great. So Pete finally sees yet another slaying. Oh wait, so headline. Nothing, he doesn't do anything about it. He's like, huh? When I was a little kid growing up, my mom had a friend who had a son who was older than me and was a big comic book person who also drew. And he was 
definitely influenced by Todd McFarlane and would copy his style all the time. And I remember seeing him draw the panel of Spider-Man putting his mask on before I saw it in Torment. And he was showing me his art and I said, why is Spider-Man having such a hard time putting his mask on? <laughs> that, was my, that was my critique. You just ruined him. I, and he was like, it, it looks cool, shut up! <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, and admittedly, like, it was a, a, as far as my very small child brain was concerned, it was a pretty good approximation. Well, that's because uh, sure. every part of him is covered in tiny little hairs. And sometimes, you oh, know, yeah, yeah, it gets yeah, stuck. But he, he's like, this is, this is a bit much, which is hilarious because this panel is so flat. I, I don't understand. Like, there's like, mm. I, there's so much like to like about it. I love, he, but he there's does, also things that are not to like. Like, no. this is too flat. Like, I, I agree. So, he's so compressed in this that I don't understand. I know, I know. I know it's just because he doesn't care about this. And panel. yet, the full image of Mary Jane, which is also a, a narrative device that Todd does a lot, where it's like a person in profile looking off and then a bunch of panels that just fill in the other side of the page. Image of Spider-Man putting on his costume is cool, but again, yes, Spider-Man just kind of like throwing himself out. It's like, it, it's a good image of Spider-Man. It's like it looked also, better when it was bigger. I think that's exactly what it was. Calypso's ready for Spider-Man to fight the lizard. Uh, the drums uh, occur, and because we're carrying over at least one thing from Calypso's previous experiences, which is that the drums seem to cancel out Spider-Man's spider sense, in this, they end up like overloading his spider sense or distracting him so that the lizard can get the drop on Spider-Man. Okay, hang on. You, you were talking about visual storytelling here and you just went past these two panels. I know, isn't it amazing? Calypso throws a spider into a cauldron and a lizard into a thing to get like the lighter, lizard and the spider in together. But there's an image of Calypso holding the spider over her eye and her eye is the moon in the next panel that Spider-Man swinging past. No, it's isn't this amazing looking? And it's like one of those things where it must be frustrating as like a connoisseur of art and as a person who you know is more anthropological looking at this being like, why is it so inconsistent? Like there's some things that are just friggin' groundbreaking and there's other things that are like, eh. And it's because all of it is predicated on, will it look really cool? But that drives me nuts. Because then it feels like none of this is intentional. Yeah, but it definitely is. Like he, it's like he's doing it's subliminal. it, subliminal. But like, like I, he doesn't know why he's doing it, and that like is fine. But it also drives me crazy. Yeah, the I, drums are telling him to do it. Yeah, that's right. Like this is, I love who the, the I letter. love the lettering of the dooms and the highs. Yeah. This is also like his spider webbing. Yeah, but again, I don't know if that's intentional or not. I think that's the idea: is that the randomness of it and the suddenness of it is so jarring. And it's so antithetical to anything you've read in Spider-Man before, unless it's Venom. Because of course the Venom fight with Spider-Man, the first one, is very much like a, oh my God, like what am I gonna do? I can't outrun this foe and he's relentless. But Venom talked a lot. Yeah. At least there was some humanity involved, mm -hmm. even if it was fighting an alien. It's okay, Connors can scribble on some walls for him. Yeah, he never does that again. And there's no good reason for him to do it in the first place. But Connors says nothing. Right. So Spider-Man is just attacked out of nowhere by what he thinks is a friend. Sometimes foe, but there's a friend in there, so he's holding back. But the lizard is more savage than he's ever been, ever. And so it's really kind of scary and jarring, plus the spider sense is working right. Also, lizard's claw tips are poisoned. So when lizard gets first blood on Spider-Man, now Spider-Man is addled. Now Spider-Man is being affected like by Like with the poison. dart? Yes. So Spider-Man fights the lizard and just it's a moment where he realizes like this guy's not gonna like it's it's just this this mouth that's just coming for me. Kinda like Venom, but moving on. And kinda like Mary Jane moving on. Oh and so he is just trying to get away from him at this point. The narration. Pull his switch. tail off. <laughs> That'll be just gross. His tail's just be <laughs> He's like, no, that's a defense mechanism if it's being chased. Oh, that right. happens in the Amazing Spider-Man movie. Lizard sheds his tail and he's like, ah! <laughs> We actually got to see that in live action, how neat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we see like the narration, and the narration is never, it's, it, there is an omniscient narrator, but it's also one that's kind of invested, where it's like. Or like, we're Spider-Man. Yeah, like, for the first time in the while, you believe you can die, so you fight. And thankfully, the letterer does at least differentiate who's, t who's thinking or narrating. Spider-Man's thoughts have a shadow behind its narration boxes, whereas the other ones don't. So Double who, boxes. So when it says, for a while you believe you can die, that's the omniscient narrator talking to Spider-Man in real time as it's happening. Whereas the uh, shadow boxes are, I, I've got to get away. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in pain. I don't know if that's quite enough. <laughs> 
I, I, I feel also, like they should be different colors or... Yeah, because it is just like, there's, there's virtually no difference in terms of like coloration. The only indication you get that it's different is context and one box behind another box. But I think it also adds to the frenetic kind of chaotic nature of the book where you're just like, you are just reading and you're getting through the art and you're just like, <sighs> like... So while Lizard tries to get at Spider-Man, Spider-Man just like swings wildly at the lizard and knocks the lizard away and the lizard lands on a piece of shrapnel, like a giant jagged piece of the environment and it plunges through Lizard's chest. Oh, we can see that though? Well, the, the, the blood is black. That's and also it's the, that was an accident. That that's was an, an accident. Act, that's an act of God. Yes. Insurance isn't gonna cover that. That's exactly right. That's, <laughs> that's force majeure. Oh, the drum stopped. That's right. So that means Maybe. the lizard's dead. Are the drums meant to be his heartbeat? I think that the, I mean, obviously, you know, definitely if you, I mean, just, I, just in terms of imagery and evocative nature, yeah, like the drums are the, are the heartbeat. But also, there are real drums though. Right, but, and yes. ma but maybe that's like, yes, maybe part of the frenzy that he's in is the, the fact that he's not controlled by himself, he's controlled by the drums, and yes. so like, the drums like match his heartbeat, driving him ever on. Yeah, so Spider-Man like takes a minute just to process the fact that he's murdered a man, and when he looks back up, Connors is gone. But is there's it, also blood everywhere, so he's like, is, okay. The lettering's great. Isn't it? On this. Oh it's my like god. Annoying. Yeah, the lettering of, of, of his... You, like, you don't know where to go next. Yes. And that's fine, like, you, like you're not meant to. Exactly. Like, you, you can read them in any. Yeah, one of the what? things that Todd wanted <laughs> yeah, to do... I like that he yells, what's happening to me? Yeah, because he's gone. He's like, what's happening to me? Like, I just fought the lizard. I kicked him onto a thing. I murdered him. He's gone. Yeah, but like, there's clearly like blood there. It's not like there's nothing there and you don't know if that if really, like, if really happened. Like, he can tell that really happened. Right, but this is, it, it's... Yeah, but he just impaled the lizard to death. Yeah. Like he didn't, he, I mean, the environment impaled him to death. <laughs> So yeah. one of the things that Todd wanted to have happen is that Mary Jane stayed at home and fretted over where Spider-Man was, and Salakrup was like, no! We did that in Craven's Last Hunt. Let's not do that again. That's How boring. about boring. Yeah. Give her a life. Yeah, give her something to do. So Mary Jane wants to hang out with Peter again, you know, like he was a monster last night. So she goes clubbing. And so why, and, and Todd's like, got it. So he uses Mary Jane's clubbing as a way to echo what's happening to Spider-Man. Barely. So she's dancing the night away and he's dancing with the guilt of murdering a friend. Well, he's he's dancing with the lizard because the lizard will, of course, keep coming I back. I guess you could also go with like rhythm. Yes. Like, oh yeah, and we do that too. The rhythm of the drum, the rhythm of like... Of the beat, of, yeah, her, of like, her party. But yet there's no doom, doom, doom in the background. What the well, hell? Doom, I mean, obviously the word doom signifies dread. The uh, And the drums, if it was doom at Mary Jane, we would, we would immediately think subconsciously or, or consciously that Mary Jane was in some kind of peril. Meanwhile, Spider-Man is also poisoned. So he is dealing with the confusion of what he just got, what he just went through, and he's feeling like his guts are on fire. Um, has Connor ever used poison before? No, well he's never been manipulated by a voodoo witch before. So, so she, she dipped his, his, his claws in poison. Okay. Yeah. Got it. We don't see that. Well, what if he scratched himself? Well, he just doesn't do that. Maybe it only works on warm-blooded animals. Okay. So here's an opportunity. We don't, it wasn't always like this. Here's an origin for the lizard. Moving on. Uh, while he's worried about everything, you know, trying to cut, like, die, this is not what the lizard is. Like, it's also like, it's almost like editorial's like, we're not gonna do this lizard story again. Like, this is not a new status quo for the lizard. No, so, he's not a, just a raging monster. Right, so when the reader picks this up, they need to understand this is not a normal status quo for the lizard, nor will it be the status quo for the lizard going forward. So, has yeah, Spider-Man status quo for the lizard going forward, apparently because he'd be dead. That's right, well he's been dead twice now. So, while he's getting his bearings, you know, Mary Jane is getting hit on by guys and she like spills her drink and it shatters on the ground as Calypso is pouring the last elixir into the voodoo pot that will mix together the battle that will be joined between Lizard and Spider-Man. So there's like a spider on the, beaker that she pours in and so the spider falls and Spider-Man's out of water tower. A lot of falling, a lot of water, it's starting to rain. <laughs> I don't like, th that doesn't, if, like, I don't find that to be super... Here's why it's cool. Well done. No, but he here's when it starts to work. is because it shatters, it's starting to rain, Spider-Man's getting rained on, nothing really new about this. He starts to look at the rain falling on him and some of it is red. 
Oh yeah. Oh, his suit is bleeding. Yeah. He looks up. Oh no, he didn't set it uh, to cold. That's right. So his suit leeches into his whites. So Spider-Man looks up and the rain that's coming down on him is the lizard descending on him with the open wound that Spider-Man put in his chest and the blood's just pouring out of him onto Spider-Man. Yeah, well, Spider-Man's like, ew, gross! Yeah, there's actually a fight between him and Venom previously drawn by Todd McFarlane in which they were in like a slaughterhouse and Venom dumps a giant thing of offal onto Spider-Man and it gives him a panic attack. That's fair. <laughs> which I'm like, fair. Oh, which I'd never seen before or since. Uh, so yeah, Spider-Man is suddenly surrounded by hooves and ears and and, 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 and viscera. viscera. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like Spider-Man doesn't like being covered in blood, so, like anyone. But anyway, so but it's a cool image of like that's the last page moment. It's just like Lizard is just he's alive, but like otherworldly. Yeah, I gotta tell you, this is the worst place in the world to put the bullpen bulletins. <laughs> yeah, well, that's because this thing is being made for the trade. They I'm like, care. I'm like, I, I I could not find this. I thought. Yeah. I was like, wait, where's that page? Where's that page? I don't, yeah, uh, 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 it's sandwiched between five oh, ads. Oh, but it's all—it's not ads. It's—it's it's all for them. It's yeah, for them. Spider Mania. Yeah, it's, Legends it's of the Arachnite. Yeah, they call it, that's what they put on the front cover of the first issue, because you know, Dark Knight. That's what this was called originally. No, it was just a joke. It was—it was a self-referential joke. Oh. So Spider-Man gets attacked by the lizard again, and it's just another brutal knockdown, drag-out fight. But I love the description where they're just like, it's a locked in a deadly battle for which. The reason for which Spider-Man has absolutely no clue. Spider-Man does not know what's yeah. happening. He's just, yeah, it's just an excuse to draw crazy cool things, but also we're, we're seeing Spider-Man in this really like weird, tense, confusing circumstance where he's getting assaulted from all angles and his body is betraying him. So he can't even get his bearings because like he's feeling sick and but tired. Because he's, he's poisoned and the drum is And know, the drums are in his head. Sense. Yeah, exactly. He's gonna have to rise above it all. That's true, he will. Uh, so Spider-Man fights the lizard while Mary Jane like goes from club to club and, uh, and, and ultimately the lizard does get the upper hand on Spider-Man. Spider-Man kind of like is laid out. And before the lizard can plunge his teeth into his jugular, Calypso calls out stop to the lizard from miles away, just, you know, subliminally or, you know, through the magic. Why? Because the spider must suffer, she says. This is awesome. Isn't uh, it? Like, yeah. I feel like he's suffering. Well, yeah, but she also wants to see it. And uh, this is also our first reveal of Calypso. Like we've seen her in shadow or in silhouette, but here we are, this is actually her. And I can imagine Spider-Man readers going like, who, what, huh? So she stops him. Lizard picks up Spider-Man, throws him off of a rooftop, and Spider-Man lands in garbage. I mean, thank God he didn't land on his neck. He could have died. That's right. Well, it says, only the discarded garbage made for man's use saved Spider-Man from death. Do we need to say that? Just say, the, the trash that saved Spider-Man's life or something. As he lands in, in Mouse Town. <laughs> Rat City. <laughs> Sorry. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Um, this is also one of my favorite images of Spider-Man of Is all it time. this? Is this ad for Bonk? for the TurboGrafx-16? No. This is, I mean, I do love reading month to month. Mm -hmm. this but is, I don't miss these fucking ads. This is why like trade reading is so much better, because it's like, you turn the page, and I turn the page, and I'm like, oh, oh I just got a little, little two-page story oh, about Bonk. Okay, I got it, here we but go. But yeah, <gasps> look at that. Just, just the incredible amount of detail, and I can understand why the detail is like a problem. Yeah. Like why it will ruin some new young artist's careers because they think this is what you're supposed to yeah, get. Yeah, they, they don't know, they don't understand and they can't manage it. Yeah. Um, why is this cool to you, but when Danny Ketch falls in crash? Because uh, it's Danny Ketch? I think because he does that in issue 25 of his entire existence, and this is like year 30 of Spider-Man's <laughs> career. There's a reason for him to fall in trash. Yeah, watching Spider-Man lose is rare. It looks like Ben's hitting on Sal right now. <sighs> what are you talking about? Excuse We're having me. a cozy I'm moment. like right here. I like how expertly Ben kept me from being able to get away from it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yay! That's a Christmas card. <laughs> so, so Spider-Man's unconscious. Well, how about an origin story? So we see Spider-Man's origin, whatever, who cares? Oh, he's nestled in a bed of garbage. That's what it says, literally. Yeah, that's his origin. Garbage. No, the Damn. origin is perfect. His current status quo is garbage. 
It looks like he's going. Toot. Yeah, I don't. I I don't understand. It's it is a great pose. Like it's a pose that says it's it's Spider Man letting the burglar get away, right? It's a it's a it's a pose that says I don't care. But also, what are you doing? Spider Man eventually gets to his feet, and when he does, he is met by spawn. The, no, yeah, actually, maybe one day, but uh, in the meantime, Spider Man gets up. Come on. I know, right? Oh my god, yeah. Maybe there's a tail. Missed opportunity. So on Sponge Chef tail. <laughs> you know what he those, has a tail? No, you chains. know what that motion of the tail will be replaced by fucking chains. Chains. So Spider Man so gets out of the is, garbage. This is, this is the moment that something awakened within Todd McFarlane. Wait a minute. This is the panel. I've got oh. it. Oh, I like the shadow. I like how this looks. So Spider Man gets up out of the garbage, and when he finally gets to his feet, he is met by the corpse of Craven the Hunter, reanimated <laughs> with the lizard by his side, with a big honk and a hole taken out of Craven's head. Again, whoa. This is <laughs> this is something very this also feels spawn. And I yeah. don't know if it's because of like there's like a little thing down there, and I'm like thinking like little Like thing. Violator yeah, or something. Yeah, Violator or something like that. Like you're seeing like the Violator mouth starting to come about. I know yes. it's Influence a bit like Venom. Yeah, yeah. But even then, like, the lizard mouth is not Venom's mouth, but also you could see where they parallel each other or echo each other. Mm. And that will, of course, inform Violator, which will be the furthest exaggeration of that. But also, I've never seen the lizard look cooler. I'm sorry. I, I just think it's I awesome. wish he had a little more head. I know that's not what a lizard would look like. It's yeah. Just, it's just, yeah, it's more crocodilish. It's weird. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, do you all prefer Craven pants or Craven loincloth? I mean, loincloth. The loincloth is the way to go. I think I like the pants. Yeah. I want a little more mystery. That's fair. There's mystery there. I mean, he wouldn't unless there's a breeze. <laughs> yeah. Which <laughs> will never happen in a battle against Spider-Man. But just the image of Craven the Hunter, like this is. This is the first time I ever saw Craven the Hunter. With a big hole in his head? Yes. Oh. Huh. Like, I didn't you're, know. You're like, this guy's cool. Well, no, I knew what it was a ghost. What the hell happened this, to Tarzan? Thankfully, <laughs> the, the story does tell you who Craven is and everything, but so I was like, okay. But the image of Craven the Hunter with this visual of it's definitely post-death, I don't know. There's something about it where I was like, whoa. Also, it's just so violent and so graphic and so out of place in a Spider-Man comic book that it just really is striking. Let's go closer. Let's get really in on that hole. So, well, this image? Oh, so this is the one that he colored. Yes. Too. Because I was like, oh, that's just normal. But then you see him stark white. Yeah. That's creepy as hell. Yeah, you could tell like there is a difference in the approach to how we're depicting Craven. One is a little more literal. The other one is like, he's a corpse. This is interesting getting uh, some of like, Tom McFarlane of the Times take on Spider-Man. Yeah. And like what he was doing with it. Well, and is he be, how forthcoming is he being? Is he being honest? Is he being genuine? Right, 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 because he's talking about the characterization. Right. Someone like critiques it, like the issue. Mm -hmm. Oh, for the first issue? Yeah, that it seems mediocre. <laughs> the plot at this point seems mediocre. Then again, it's only been one issue so far. Wow, that could have been written today based yes. on what kind of feedback we've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, books. yeah, yeah. I really like the artwork, says this person. Uh, I mean, me too. That mouth and that jaw for the lizard mm -hmm. was like, it's very baboonish, mm. but it's very primal. Yeah, yeah. Well, because he is like a man in there too. So it's like, you could get both. You could cheat it. You know, yeah, it's a lizard, but like, I mean, what does a lizard man look like? Also, I will go out on a limb here. This is my favorite version of the lizard. I mean, if it isn't okay. implicit already, I hate most versions of the lizard. This is the one I prefer. You can see how Todd's colors also, he's going for it. Yeah, he's trying. Why do you want to color this one? I don't know. I think and only I, this one. I think because it's similar to Salak insisting that Todd ink himself. It's like, try it. You know, you mm. never really colored yourself. Give it a try. You know, make this book more like yours. So he didn't do uh, the Craven Spider Man fight, did he? No. No, Craven's Last Hunt was drawn by Mike Zeck. Okay. Years prior. Uh, so, you know, we've got Craven in here. Let's remind you of Craven's Last Hunt. Spider-Man's in a, you know, Spider-Man's practically buried in garbage, but when he fought Craven the, the last time, he was buried alive for two weeks. Right, and he's not even sure if this is really happening. That's right. Right? Like, I mean, well, now like, I'm seeing Craven's you know, corpse in front of me with a hole in his head, so I'm like... Yeah, he's like, the lizard, I 
seemingly died, but then he was gone. I know I'm poisoned. My spider sense isn't working, and now Craven's front of me with a big hole in his head. I might be losing my mind. Yeah. Yes. Might be? <laughs> well, I'm definitely losing my mind, but it might not. there might not be anything happening in front of me. Oh, who wore it better, Craven or Calypso? Right? That's why there's a loincloth. The loincloth switch is because Calypso is actually standing in place of Craven, gotcha. and she uses her magic to create an illusion. At first I thought it was just a hallucination by Spider-Man, but apparently it's an illusion by Calypso. But uh, anyway. This is awesome. Yes, yes. The paralleling of Spider-Man triumphantly blasting out of this grave during Craven's Last Hunt, and Spider-Man pathetically blasting out of... Like, you know, garbage. Garbage. <laughs> Only to collapse is just awesome. This is better color though in here, like the 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 darker. There's more, yeah. There's more depth. There's more. There's yeah. Yeah, I, I there's like. There's more it too. contrast. Yeah. So, Calypso's here. She's like, "This is going great," and you're like, "What's going great? Like, what are you even talking about?" I mean, she's winning. She is winning. That's true. But to what end? Why? What? There's no explanation I mean, unless you know that she used to bed Craven and that she also was like, just cheat. Like she's constantly like, just, just kill him. And he's like, no, you know what to understand. He's cheating, he has spider powers. Right, and he's nothing. Apologies to those Craven fans out there. Enjoy your movie. So <laughs> Calypso uses blood magic and voodoo to make Lizard into like a primal force. Like there is no Connors in there. So when Calypso is not controlling Lizard, Lizard is m just a murder machine. So like, when Calypso bids Lizard collect Spider-Man and bring him to her house, Lizard just wants to eat him or kill him. But thankfully we are also spared of any like Renfield-esque like, let me eat him master. You know, there's no bullshit. He just, it just, the narration says that like, he smells the blood of his enemy and how long will it continue to obey? No one knows. Like, right, thank you. Mm. So MJ like, Goes partying, she goes home, it's midnight, he's not home, she's like, damn it, goes back out. All right, I'll keep, uh, I'll keep clubbing until Pete gets home. Maybe we can get a little frisky, who knows. So we're now back at Calypso's What if he place. was gonna be home in five minutes? Well then, he'll just have to wait. So we're at Calypso's place and she's just like, wow, you're awake already, okay. And he's like, where's Craven? And she's like, where's Craven, you idiot? He's dead. You know what happened to Craven! <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's she's all like, your fault. Yeah, but she says he was he did not have the power, he wasn't worthy. And so he's just like, nah. And I love, she's like just reveling in her own insanity. And so Lizard is close to Spider-Man, he goes, hey doc, get me out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, please, for the love of God, just stop. I know you're in there somewhere. Yeah, and Lizard tries to eat his face. And she says, no, like, you'll eat soon, my pet. And then proceeds to do some, like, more uh, drums and voodoo med. It's just imagery that we can put into the book. Okay, whatever. Here's the scene that I don't like the most. It's just this image of, like, it looks like Lizard is eating Spider-Man's mask. Oh, where he's, like, encircling his head with his teeth? Yeah, because he's not. He's just in front of, he's, the, he's in the foreground and Spider-Man's in the background. But, like, what? And it, it, I, I remember reading in a critique of it where it's like, the pages are really crowded. And I'm like, sometimes they are very, when, when they are crowded, they're very crowded. Oh. And they're never not crowded. You know what it is? There's just too many tangents. There's yeah. just too many tangents and, and, and the, oh, yeah, there's just like, there's a lot of like not okay, right? Mm -hmm. Like we really should like we should be seeing maybe some of the back. T yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. It's like just, the the, the just... top part of Lizard's jaw almost perfectly continues mm -hmm. the silhouette of Spider-Man's head. But like so his, it looks like he's in it. Like the upper teeth, you should maybe be able to see some of the other ones because they're not exactly mm -hmm. you know symmetrical. No, yeah. Like they would be. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this, this, that was a mistake. He's just, trying stuff. But he it's is. awkward. That He's is, going for that it. That is not okay. Yeah. So Spider-Man's like, why don't you give me your super villain <laughs> monologue? The villains always want to tell me their origin stories. And so uh, she doesn't, but we get it anyway. Like she just kind of like strokes off. Like she's just like, no, oh, my origin. And she never actually explains it to him. But the idea is that like, you know, she grows up in this culture that worships voodoo magic. Uh, she embraces it meets the hunter, hooks up with him, Craven dies, she goes back to her land to become more powerful, murders her sister in a ritual sacrifice, and then becomes more powerful and uses the voodoo magic to become the Calypso that we've seen in this book. All right. Uh, all right. 
Yeah, right? Like, not a classic enduring Spider-Man villain origin, but, you know, who am I to argue? I do love the image of Craven in this. This is one of my favorite yeah. images of Craven. It's just... It's great. That's it. So she thinks about her origin. She's like, all right, it's time. I guess because Spider-Man reminded her of Craven, but, she, but the whole thing is done for Craven. She's wearing a, like... Female Craven, eh, not even female. She's wearing Craven's outfit. Like she is doing all this for Craven, but she's like, Craven was fool and weak and helpless. It, you know what? We're done. It's time to kill him. And Spider Man then rallies his strength, breaks his bondage, kicks the lizard into some stuff. Because, oh, you know, she's magic, so she's got candles everywhere. And uh, those are magic candles. Yeah. Uh, these are just fire candles because when he kicks the lizard into like the wall, he ruptures a line that has, like, gas in it. And Spider-Man notices, but again, it's just like, the image of, like, the close-up of, like, the first drop of gas into the first flame. It's just like, I love that. Just this... Da, da, da. The, oh, okay. Yeah. But I like, I also like the, like, surrendered acceptance of... He's just like, there's no time for this. And just, kaboom! And the whole place just goes up. The cops immediately respond. They almost uh, hit Mary Jane's taxi cab on the way over there, and Spider-Man is wrecked. He manages to avoid being killed by the explosion, but like- Everyone is, should be wrecked. Well, one of them is unkillable. The other one is a magic being, and Spider-Man is the main character. I was gonna say unkillable because of the, the magic that she's using. Yeah, that's true. But if she got dead in an explosion- Well, that's true. So is he. Right. Well, she isn't. So, uh, we also get, like, the most wrecked Spider-Man's ever been. The cover of this book is one of, like, they made it into a poster. Of, like, just... Yeah, I've seen this. This is the, this is the breaking point for Spider-Man. It's an image that they'll keep using when we need to establish that Spider-Man has hit his breaking point. Because you can see his mouth. Well, and also, if we can see his mouth, it means he's been through some shit. And there's hair shooting at the top. Yep. Yeah. Todd loves hair. He likes putting it in places. Toink. Which is fun. Um, but yeah, so Spider-Man's like, all right, um, I I don't, there's no fight here. Like, there's no Spider-Man comic here. Is I have it, to just leave. Is this also, like, a reference to that time when he's, like, trapped underneath? Oh, it could be. All the rubble. Yeah, yeah. Hey, did you pick up book five and didn't know what happened? <laughs> well, here Here's you a little go. backstory. That's exactly what. Here's a panel or two. Yes, thank you. So... The drums start back up. Lizard is resurrected. I guess the idea is that Lizard did die, but then came back. Because you can see the Calypso also took damage. Like, she has, like, a bleeding face, and she says, my pet, nothing can stop us. And I guess that's their way of being like, I didn't know if I couldn't die, but now right. I guess I do know that. Even though she will definitely it's die. It's a really weird... The Lizard is wrong in this panel. <laughs> he looks like he's got a schnoz. He looks like Jimmy Durante as the Lizard. It's terrible. It's, a, it's an image that haunts me because I love this book and I will always sing its praises. And also, it looks like Lizard has a giant nose. <laughs> yep. In that one panel. And, in, and only in that one panel. And that's the problem is that, like, you'll have these pages that are spectacular sequences of, of prowess and, and, and talent. And then also, like... He's trying stuff. He's like, maybe this works. How yeah, about this? Nope. Well, I don't Well, it's already in there. <laughs> He's not snarling. He's sneezing. <laughs> Yeah, because so, he has such a, a large nose. Yep. So Calypso tries to find Spider-Man, I guess. She just, like, stands in the middle of the rubble and then, like, closes her eyes and waits. And then Spider-Man sweats on her by accident. She goes, oh, there he is. And then she sends Lizard to get him. Uh, he bursts out of his hiding place and faces the Lizard. Lizard immediately just kicks his ass and he whimpers in fear of the Lizard because he's just so exhausted and tired and, and sick. <laughs> just, just too much. So Mary Jane's like, all right, I'm done partying. I got to go home. And I hope Peter's okay. And, uh, and he better be there. Right. Otherwise, I'm giving him hell. Right? So Lizard is going to go kill Spider-Man for, I think, what, the fourth time? And Calypso goes, no. <laughs> Lizard just turns up and be like, when? Wh when am I going to kill this guy? Yeah. It's obviously why I'm here. <laughs> I stayed silent the entire time. I haven't said a single word. Right. I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> but she says, there's something wrong. Something's wrong. The poison should have killed him by now. We have two pages left. There's no time for you to introduce some other weird element to this. But what's suspicious is that Babylon 5 creator J. Michael Straczynski does not ape off of this to say that like, oh, the spider totem, like there's magic involved that's protecting Spider-Man. Like maybe that. You know, like use that 25 yeah. years later. And go like, there's something wrong, why? And it's like, because the spider god said no. 
Right. Or there's some kind of aura around him that protects him from magic attack. Nope. It's just Spider-Man's really strong and she underestimated him. Yeah, she thought she wouldn't have to up the dosage as much. She's like, yeah. and then he, and then Craven should have absolutely cheated. Yes. <laughs> She's completely justified in her actions. So he's just like, well, just tell me why this is happening, please. And then, you know, is met with nothing but stony silence and goes, screw this, and just leaves. And so he jumps out of the way, away from a lizard, and lizard starts coming at him. So he grabs a whole bunch of random chains. Chains! Ooh, chains! <laughs> Money, ka -ching, And he just whips them at the lizard. The lizard is then inexplicably strung up in them and he hangs to death. Uh, Spider-Man's very good at slinging webs, so he's very good at throwing chains too. There you go. I Wait. Want, can, we, can we add, by the way, throwing chains as a new term for kicking ass or, 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 or you know, Wait. fighting? So like, you wanna throw chains? <laughs> yes. It like, kinda works. Like, so Spider-Man and Lizard start throwing chains and it is dope. But no, I mean, like, but he killed him and he's just like, that's fine. You know, the narrator says, he hurls chains with every ounce of power enough to break a neck. The creature has been denied its final time. Yeah. Well, she did say that was the final time she could resurrect the lizard, right? Like, that no. was the last battle? No, it's just the last battle because the book's over. Oh. No, Guess even... who's next? Yeah, well, he says... Is he threatening to kill her? Time now to bluff. Oh. Guess who's next? Yeah, that's his, his I way. I just kill. I literally I just the killed the lizard. And now I'm going to threaten this woman. Yeah. I mean, he's just trying to scare her away. He's just like, I just want to go home. <laughs> like, I don't want to be here anymore. I, I would really like it if you stopped. Yeah, it's like, uh, I killed lizard. I'll kill you too, unless you just, just open the door for me. <laughs> Every policeman in the area has arrived. Yep. And Calypso's like, I don't have the ability or time to fight an army of cops. So she calls in everything from the building into her and collapses the building on top of herself and Spider-Man gets away. That's not really anything. No. So he escapes and what the narrator explains is that like, they're gonna read the newspaper the next day and it's gonna say that there was like a monetary, the news will report a monetary value of the property damage. They'll state that only one fireman was injured from the experience and no bodies were found, which will only leave even more unanswered questions. So the lizard didn't die. Right. But Peter didn't know that. No, he did not. Peter was just like, I killed the lizard and I'm just gonna be I'm fine with it. Well, I, I killed the lizard twice. I will worry about that when I wake up, if I wake up. But I love the image of him landing. Like he gets home and he can't even like descend. He just falls through the skylight and lands in the bathroom and just says, honey, I'm home just as a wreck. She's like, oh boy, here we go. Oh my God. So yeah, uh, so presumably Mary Jane nurses him back to health. There is no story after this where we explain any, th any of that or talk about like how scary or horrible that was. Uh, but we do also- Or all the emotional trauma he's endured by being like, I just killed a man twice. Yeah, no, no. We do get lizard stories after this and the next one is gonna be an Amazing Spider-Man kind of like anniversary issue where lizard's like back to normal. You know, like, because Calypso no longer is manipulating Lizard, Lizard goes back to normal. So Lizard decides to, you know, try and fix his problem. And you're like, okay, whatever. All that matters is Lizard So we know die. that he survived. We have no indication. We don't know about Calypso. Okay. But she did survive. But like, I guess it doesn't matter because, like, the Lizard was a tool, so it's nice to know that he survived, whereas yes. she doesn't have that right because she is actually the villain behind all of this. Uh -huh. Okay. But seriously, that's not really an ending. No, it just stops. There, that's there's very, really that's no- That's like a very spawn ending. Oh yeah. Where he's like, look, I'm gonna do the first trade, cliffhanger. No. Then they're gonna have me do the next trade. It's the Todd McFarlane way. There is no, well, that is that is how we will deal with spawn. We'll be to string your audience along. This, the next story is just something else. There's no carryover. I understand, like I've met writers who talk about, like write the story you want to see. like. Don't hold back when mm. you're writing a story. Like everything you've always wanted to see, write it down and right, put it in your right, story right, because right. like no one else is gonna tell your story. But Todd doesn't even do that. You know, it's not like I've always wanted to see Spider-Man with half a mask suspended in broken wood. You know what I mean? It's, it's just a, it's just, it is rad, but it is also things that he decided to draw. Like he got to pick what happened. Right. 
You know, right. I, I don't know about the Calypso angle. I know that he definitely wanted Calypso to manipulate someone. And the discussion behind the scenes that we're privy to is that he didn't pick Lizard first. So we don't know if like Calypso was also a mandate or whether it was like, it was always gonna be Calypso. Cause I wanted to mirror Kramer's last hunt. I thought there was gonna be more from Craven to torment. I know. Spider Man. I know, but like saying all these things, but there's he doesn't say anything. No, nah, he just, says like I found my friend the spider. Like that's, he says one line and that's yeah. it. This guy breaks down the pages of one issue and just gives him notes <laughs> and critique. <laughs> Holy shit! It's uh, it's incredible. And the final paragraph is: I think you're trying too hard to make up for your writing and experience, Todd. Loading a page with a, with redundant captions in no way can compensate. If one picture is worth a thousand words, you're already giving us our money's worth. And don't worry, your writing style is already showing slight improvement since your first issue. That's torment. It is just the senseless beating of an innocent man. It's a little strange where they put the eyes on her costume. That's where Cravens are. Yeah. I hate to say it. I know. It's accurate. I thought his were higher. No? Uh, sometimes. Uh, Mysterios are higher. Mysterios are higher? Oh, okay. Mysterio does also have eyes on the on his chest for his costume, which is weird. And they were, they're a little higher. They're a lot higher, actually. Yeah, Mysterios are up here. Hey, my eyes are down here. <laughs> Dear Todd, an artist you are, a writer you most certainly are not. That's the entire letter. Holy crap! Yeah, we are robbed of the peanut gallery's opinions about how successful Torment is. And I have to admit, you know, like, I definitely didn't echo those sentiments, but I was not a connoisseur at the time. I was just, in, in fact, I was not reading those at the time. I was just, I, I got them after the fact. This is my first exposure to Torment is this trade paperback, which I did not get off the shelf. This was a secondhand book that I got when I started getting into comic books. But uh, yeah, I, I was also not privy to like what the audience's response was, and, I just went for it. And I'm and, like, this is awesome. And you know, there was like something to be said that of course it's like with social media, it's like someone could just send something like that. Without thinking about it. Instantaneously, right? Yeah, like, and then they can regret it or, or maybe like they can be really hasty about right, it. Right, but it's like, at least if you're a writer back when these were coming out and someone had to like go they, write it. They wrote it in their typewriter. Put it in a, an envelope, get a stamp get someone to mail it somehow. Like you knew there was a process that that person had to go through. Yes, they, you know how, how strongly they felt about well, it. Well, or that it was just like, at least they had to work for it. They did have to work there, for like, it. There was an effort. With a tweet, it's like, nah. I could easily ignore that. You know, it, there's something to be said about it, right? Like, I, like I'm like i partially a, a annoyed at it just being like a thing that occurs to Spider-Man, <laughs> but I partially applaud it too, because it doesn't always have to be some like- Grand, epic, big, like plot. most important, like, this is just, intricate thing. This is just literally focused on Spider-Man. No one else knows it's even happening because it is centric to Spider-Man. Spider-Man might not even be sure it happened. Yeah, oh, for sure. Oh, he'll have the bruises to prove it. That's true, something happened. <laughs> <laughs> and a building exploded. I assume you were there, but uh, otherwise, you know, lizard, Calypso, maybe. Maybe. Right, or you fought a bear at the zoo and then went to a strip club. I and was also up poisoned. A yeah, that's true. And uh, there's a great line in there where it says like, the cool. same thing that made him Spider-Man will save his life. Like the poison will just run through his system and he'll be fine. And I'm like, cool, all right. Cool. Technically that's Venom. Oh, well we already had that, so. I yeah. like the idea that he's not sure if it ever happened. Yeah. Is it ever referenced again? It is because Calypso shows back up and she tries to- She brings a, a drum. She has an, yeah, but she has an adventure with Craven's son. If you want a copy, they make a bunch of them. You can get one. Most recent one is in the comments down below. I recommend looking at it. I mean, the best way to look at it is with this. Yes, this, this is the cover from a previous story, not this one, but it's like, I remember seeing that and being like, that's Lizard now. <laughs> Who's under there? <laughs> I don't think he's trying to find out. I think he's just trying to eat him. I know, but he's like delicately peeling it back. Yeah. Yeah, it's like he's peeling a banana. Right? His, yeah. his Green Goblin also leaves much to be desired. This is... His Morbius is solid. Uh, incredible. Well, this is like issue 17 of this, though, so, so he's, he's had, already... Yeah, like he's... Right, but this is also the first time he's drawn and Morbius, And look at, though. uh, freaking what's his oh, name? Oh, the but, clown? Yeah, look at that. Yeah. I was gonna say, that reminds me very much of a uh, Tales from the Crypt kind of look. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can just, you just... That's great. Right? I'm glad I bought this. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, no, this is the preferred way. Right, yeah. If you want to look at it, uh, you won't get every page or no. even a full issue, but uh, it's still worth looking at. But some this of is, okay, so like, and I know I've said this before, but like, 
And I know there's a lot of collectors out there who own these, and that's how they're able to produce them, especially, like, it's like, Todd might have a few of these pages himself, and some collectors are willing to allow their the work that they own to be, like... Scanned. Scanned, right? But it's, like, literally, like, going to that, like, Junji Ito, like... Exhibition. exhibition. It was just a little exhibition. It, it was going from, like, at least to that Comic-Con of hers, so I went to some other ones. But it's like, that was great. We've seen some original pages of other comic book art as well at like museums. Yeah. And it's really cool to see. It is. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think that like there should be like a standard system in place with like comics. Of course, traditional art is going away. You know, it's mm -hmm. mostly like a lot of comic book art is done digitally at this mm -hmm. point. But I would imagine like if it were done physically, like we have to scan it for posterity and put it into an archival situation where it's like, yeah, the original pencils will be preserved. And like whether we decide to make some kind of an oversized printing edition or not, it's there. Right. Or it's, it's, it's preserved. So it doesn't have to be like, we have to track down like what collector picked up what pages. Like it's, it is cool that we got like these select pages, but like, why can't we have the whole damn thing? Like yeah. we should have every page so I could pour over it. Well, that's you know? like the Dark Knight collection. The Dark Knight collection is also, yeah, it's like, that's the book, but not, it's missing select pages that are owned by some collectors who are just like, no! Or not they share, or they, or they just can't find them. they don't them. know where it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, back to Torment. Yeah, I, you know what? Like, if you've never, if for some reason you never read it, I say read it. Oh, definitely. For sure. It's a it's seminal like, Spider-Man story, even if it doesn't really have any impact on the character whatsoever. It has every impact because it's also one, you know, one of the highest selling Spider-Man comics of all time. There's lots of impact in the book. There's literal impact but in it, physical and uh, that's emotional. That's what I think is so fascinating about it. It's not like, it's seminal in that it's... It affected the character metatextually. Yeah. It didn't actually do anything in this. It's story. not like it's like the first appearance of X or like the first time like he used this power. Right. It's not even Todd's like... first time drawing Spider Man. No, it's no. the first appearance of Zombie Craven. Yeah. Oh of course. No it's not I mean it's not Zombie Craven. It's no. an image. Well yeah because we got the soul of the hunter. That's also Zombie Craven. <laughs> Oh Dang. yeah, oh god, I forgot about that one. But yeah. like, so like that to me is fascinating. It's just this story where like something like mystically based first of all, which is not always something that happens to Spider-Man. No. You and know. it's also, it's not even like, oh, it's a mystical thing, so we're gonna rope in Doctor Strange. Like this is just some shit happens to Spider-Man that he And then has... he goes home. Right. He doesn't even win. He doesn't win, he, he barely, he... He barely like, makes it. He like defeats Lizard, but not really. He like kills him. Yeah. But maybe like, you know, obviously not actually. And he doesn't actually defeat the villain. No. Like, I don't know. Yeah, no, he barely escapes with his life. That's right. Yeah, Spider-Man wins because he doesn't die at the end. And He's that's like, a, and that's I a just win have for all of to us leave. every day. Yeah. <laughs> but isn't that so relatable? Haven't you ever been in a situation where you're just like, I, I just, have been I, through it. I just want to go home. Yeah, yeah, I just want to go home. Right? I just want to be comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and everything outside won't let you. Yes. Like, that's cool. It's very human. It is very human, yeah. Yeah, For Todd being McFarlane. accused of cheating, like, Spider-Man is very human, and that whole story is very human. Agreed. So there you have it. We'll see you guys next time with another episode. I'm Sal. I'm Ben. And I'm Tiffany. Keep reading. This, co this cover is going to be recreated so many times. Like, Todd will, him he himself will do at least two other versions of this. There's one with the black costume that he does. There's one that where Spawn's doing this. I was gonna ask if Spawn do this. Yeah, that's issue like four. Is it chains? It's his cape. It's his cape, okay. He's is just it, on top of his cape. Covered in little demons? <laughs> no, no, he just drops all the is spiders. Is he covered in rats? <laughs> rats. Or mice? He's actually covered in the homeless. Yeah, it's just guys. Um, yeah. Well, they do that for warmth. And Gen 13 did one where uh, it's grunge and uh, it's silly string and gum instead of webs. <laughs> <laughs>